story begins in the winter of 78. I was 28 years old. I was a grad student up at Syracuse. It was snowing outside and I was living in a very tired, ransacked apartment building on North Salina Street, watching the snow come down and thinking, ah, this is just tiresome, trying to study. I thought it would be a good idea if I could just get outside in the summer and maybe perhaps buy a boat and live out on the Erie Canal, at least away from the city. So my idea was to drag it out, put it on the shore, and just use it as like a summer apartment. So I went around to all the marinas that I could find. And um, of course, most of the stumbling block was how much money a grad student can afford. It was kind of a large problem for me to overcome. But I did happen to go to a couple marinas, and one marina that I stopped, I asked an old guy at the marina, and it was Brewerton, New York. It was Brewerton Boatyard, and I asked him, I said, well, what's the biggest and cheapest boat that you have? And he looked at me kind of quizzably and said, well, there is this old Richardson boat way at the end of the shed. It hadn't been in the water for like seven years. Um, maybe it's time for us to let that boat go. So I said, well, okay, so let me look at this thing. And when I looked at it, the original name of the boat, ironically, was Sandy. Uh, and, but I couldn't see the whole boat because it was wedged up against the wall of this old boathouse. And right next to it was a houseboat. So it was probably about six inches distance between the boat and the houseboat and six inches to the wall. But it was rather large. It was 29 feet. It was all wood. It was all painted white. It looked tired. But I, at the time, I was not thinking that it was going to float or that I wanted it to float. I just was thinking that I wanted it that had a roof on it and a little cabin that I would just use it as a summer studying place. So then I went back in and it turned out, <clears throat> I asked him what the price was. He says, well, we'd like a thousand dollars. So I said, well, let me think about it. And so I went home and talked to a few people, talked to my dad, talked to other people. And, and they said, well, you know, this boat was a 1929 Richardson and it's 1979 it's almost 49 years old it doesn't have a lot of value so offered a guy $200 for the boat so I went back to the marina I felt really embarrassed so I, I didn't offer him $200 I offered him $300 and he was an old New England salt and when I offered him two, uh, $300, he said to me, he, he almost took a bite out of the cigar and said, well, the brass alone is worth that. So, so he smiled a little bit and he says, well, how about $500? And I said, well, can you do a little bit better? I opened up my checkbook looking like I was going to write the check for $500. And then he says, well, okay we'll sell for $450. So I said, okay. So I bought the boat. Now, when I bought the boat, I really never paid any attention to the engine. I, when I looked at the engine, it looked like it had a carburetor, it looked like it had, a, had all the parts to it. Um, the owner did say it was running when he laid it up seven years ago. Uh, and so I never paid any attention to that. So the first three weeks that I had the boat, the girlfriend that I was with at the time, we spent painting it. And we painted the, the hull, and it was a real trick painting the hull because it was only six inches, and I had to go around with a little artist brush to paint the white hull. And we did that, and then I hand sanded everything because I didn't have any power tools at the time. So anyway, we painted, and I painted the bottom, but there was a hole in the boat right near the uh, or the starboard side of the, the the head what's interesting about that type of richardson it had a curved molded front and it was very characteristic of richardson's during the period 
And by the way, when I bought the boat, I didn't even know what a Richardson was. I had no idea the name of the boat. Even though the, the boatyard guy, as he chopped his, his, his cigar, he said, don't you know this is a classic boat? So I did realize then that that type of, that type of coal molding was characteristics from Richardson's from 1927 to 1931. And then they had a fire at the plant and they didn't have that, that steamer and they couldn't bend that wood. But anyway, there was a hole in the, in the bend and it was a pretty extensive hole and I had to patch the hole. So we did such a good job patching the hole and, and, and I patched it originally, all the original work was done with plywood because we couldn't afford real wood. I couldn't afford mahogany. I did what I could, what I had, and what I knew how to do. Luckily, my dad was a carpenter, so I knew a little bit of carpentry, and um, during, during the time patching the hole, we decided to call the boat patches because of the hole that was patched up front. We had that buttoned up very well, and then um, about early May, early June, the boat was ready to be hauled out. The marine owner asked, would we want to launch the boat, put it in the water? And I vividly remember this conversation I had when I admitted back to the, to the marina that I really had no intention of putting the boat in the water. And I mentioned to him that I just wanted to haul it out, pay him the monthly fee for the boat and just use it as sort of like a shed. And he looked at me quizzically after I painted the bottom, painted the white, fixed and patched the wood, and put the name Patches on the, on the, on the back of the boat, and said, well, what are you worried about? Wood floats. And I said, well, yeah, it could float upside down, who knows? <laughs> so anyway, so then I had to go back and ask my dad and my brother to come up and really look at the engine. So, so my dad did come up and my brother came up and they worked on the engine for about four or five hours. And my dad asked me early on, was the engine seized? And I said, well, I don't know. Um, I had no way of knowing. I necessarily didn't buy the boat to float it. Well, it turns out the engine was seized. The only way to unseize it was to take a gigantic pipe wrench and, and grab the, the shaft and, and slam down on the shaft and, and hopefully the um, pistons will freeze, uh, break loose. And one quick slam on the, um, uh, with the sledgehammer, the pistons were free and with a little oil, it, the pistons were going up and down and, and things looked really good. And, and they worked on that engine. We got all the spark, all six cylinder spark. Uh, we, it looked like it had gas. We probably, we couldn't start the engine because it was sitting on a railway. Uh, but it looked, smelt that it was going to go. So I told him, I said, okay, next weekend we'll put the boat in the water or next week we'll put the boat in the water. And he came up with a date. And with great apprehension, that date came and my um, younger brother, uh, Larry, uh, was there for the launching. And uh, it, was a, it was an old-fashioned railway where you had to wheel the boat laterally through. The boathouse had to be emptied. And it was, you know, our turn because all the boats had already gone. We were the last boat out because we were probably stuck in that, that end of that corner for years. And we got to, got to the railway, and then it moved down the railway on an old-fashioned truck arrangement. And then the moment of truth came. It was a rainy afternoon, cloudy. We put the boat in the water. Instantly, the pump went off. Instantly, water came pouring in every corner of the boat. And this was a concern of mine, it was concern of the original owner. Um, but the marina was thoughtful enough that right next to the railway, they brought down a, a, a big gas-powered 
pump would had a three inch hose and they knew the boat was going to leak and but when I opened up the engine covering the boat had been floating no more than about 30 seconds I looked down and I thought I was looking in a in a in a uh, uh, water was shooting every inch of the boat every corner every plank water was shooting in and they kept on saying don't worry it's gonna it'll be okay it's this it takes a little time to settle in don't worry about it we had an old six-cylinder battery and it had an old six-cylinder pump and they don't turn very fast and within 30 seconds the water was overwhelming the pump and the pump heated it just shut off it was just overloaded so we had to use a big three-inch hose pump and this the boat was launched about uh, five o'clock and we didn't it was it was such an event for us that we never thought to bring like a bottle of champagne or anything in the launching uh, and and then as soon as the the situation happened there was an older um, person at the marina there that probably had maybe one too many beers and he poured a little bit of beer sort of half and half, drank half, poured a little bit over the side of the boat and that was the christening for Patches. Um, the most interesting thing that night was as it got a little bit later in the afternoon in the evening and the boat was still leaking but you could see it was starting to slow up. Got around 8.30 and everybody started leaving. The owner of the marina said, don't worry, we'll see you in the morning. Um, here, uh, if you stay on the boat tonight, which I've tended to do, um, if the water gets up high, just pull this cord and it starts the six inch pump and it pumps out and it'll pump the boat out within 10 seconds. And it did, it would, it would do that. But as the evening went on, the water, the interval of the time that I would pull that lalliard to the time that the boat was dry well enough for the little six volt pump to continue to operate got shorter and shorter. And at one time I'm sleeping and I feel water up by the bunk as I pull the ladder. And so that was the way it worked all night long until about three o'clock in the morning. Around three o'clock in the morning the water was coming in, the boat was beginning to tighten up, the planks were beginning to tighten up and about three o'clock in the morning uh, the little six volt pump was holding its own. It would pump for about a minute, off for about a minute and pump again and that interview improved until about maybe seven o'clock where it would pump for 30 seconds and then off for about five which considering it, a boat had only been in the water in 12 hours it had really soaked up fairly well. The next day we decided to try the engine and my brother came out and like I said the week before we had my father and everybody work on the engine and it smelled like it was going to go, felt like it was going to go but we couldn't, couldn't start it. So that next day with an old six cylinder engine with the six volt battery I, I pushed the start button and pulled the choke and within two cranks the engine sputtered and, and started. And I would have to say that that Kermath engine, the original engine in the boat, ran for the next almost 20 years without missing a beat.